Welcome to the first New Tech People podcast for myself for 2022. Uh, on today's episode, we've got Dan Van Heerden from Biscuit, Software Development Manager at Biscuit, um, based here in Newcastle. Mate, uh, for those of you who, who don't know who you are, I can give us a bit of an overview. Uh, yeah, sure. Hello. Um, so Dan Van Heerden, and uh, yeah, I've been in Newcastle for probably coming up two and a half years now. Yeah. Started my career probably in 2001. Uh, worked on the old VB dot, VB6 stack uh, all the way and then went to London and worked in .NET there for quite a while and companies like Vodafone and um, smaller companies as well and some contract work and then moved over to Perth where I was working for Student Edge. Uh, some of the younger people might know that. Worked there for about five years, built a new website back then and um, that's where I kind of started moving into more leadership roles. Yeah. Uh, then got kind of headhunted by um, uh, RS Insurance. Um, and yeah, basically from there, uh, I was the development manager there for, for all the, they call it a capability lead there yeah. uh, for the developers. And that then transitioned over into applying for the job at Biscuit. And yeah. that's how I came over to Newcastle. Yeah, nice. Um, You've obviously, you've done South Africa, you've done England, you've done Perth, now Newcastle. Yeah. Uh, obviously some different experiences along there. You've been here for two years now. I mean, what's your uh, what's your experience been like uh, working here in Newcastle? Uh, it's It's been good. Uh, we are, I had a bit of a culture shock when I first got here, coming from big city, big city, big city, and then yeah. Newcastle. It ended up being actually really nice when we actually got into the swing of things and the way things move here is a little bit different to the big cities. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy it. The people are good here. People are friendly. There's some good talents around. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, enjoying it so far. Nice. Mate, I'll take that career and I'll just dig in there a tiny bit, mate, yeah. right back at the start. Yep. Um, mate, what, what compelled you to get into technology to start with? Oh, uh, so my mother was a computer science teacher. Yeah. Uh, so you didn't and, have a choice. Well, yeah, I, I kind of, um, she had textbooks lying around all the time. And I think I was about 10 and I picked up a textbook. Yeah. And I started messing around on the computer. Yeah. By the time I got to high school, I basically knew the curriculum for the high school, uh, for the entire high school year. And so then went to uni and it was kind of engineering IT, engineering IT. And I think it was probably my math that made the decision for me then. I just went, okay, I'll just go IT. Yeah. And I did the BSC IT then, and that's the rest is history. Mate, on that point, you've, you've now one of my favorite questions in, uh, on this <laughs> podcast. Uh, university and education for people, especially in the tech industry, software development in particular. Yeah. What was your experience like going through university? Let's start, what was your experience like? And then we'll dig a bit deeper. Oh, I loved it. It was yeah. great. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, my first year was a bit of a right off because just kind of the freedom of just being out and about and with mates and just partying basically 24 yeah. seven. Uh, so that uh, was a bit of a right off from a study point of view. But yeah, after that got into it, got it done. And I, I, it was fun. I mean, they don't teach you what you need in a job, but they teach you very, they, they're very good at kind of putting the foundation down and giving the fundamentals right for you. And I think that's very important. And I think that's probably what self-taught people that don't go through that university, you sometimes miss is that those fundamentals, they just go straight to the coding. Yeah. Um, so yeah, from that point of view, it's really good. No, it's an interesting take and a pretty common take, to be honest. I, I feel yeah. like a lot of people in the tech space in particular that have done university degrees, it's not actually what you're going to do in your day-to-day -day job, but it does teach you both fundamentals of technology, but also uh, teaching you how to learn. I think that's the second one. Like Yeah. It's hard to think and how to structure things. And it's, it's just that that ability to think about things kind of progressively getting more complicated rather than just jumping right in at the end, which I think happens if you if you don't aren't kind of forced through that a couple of times during university. And then you get you if you just go straight into it yourself, you kind of go, OK, well, I have to get this done. I have to make this work and you just make it work. Yeah. And you don't really understand the fundamentals of the things under, underlying it. So yeah, definitely from that point of view, how to learn, how things are structured, how to actually learn things properly. So you actually know what you're doing, not just doing it um, is definitely valuable from a university. I, I'm sure you can get the same out of like a diploma or something like that. Um, I've, um, I've got some guys who's got diplomas. I've got some guys who's got degrees. I've got some guys who's got nothing self-taught. Yeah. Um, 
and you, you, there's definitely differences in the way they approach problems yeah which is always very interesting to kind of see yeah um when i get somebody in who i know doesn't have that background i actually take them through i just set out a couple of LinkedIn learning courses for them. It's like, go back to the basics, get the fundamentals, yeah. then do another course that show you how to actually apply the fundamentals and then go get on and actually start coding so that you can actually yeah. just understand where everything's coming from. Right. You've brought up a couple of pieces here, which I'm going to try to dig <laughs> into. I'm going to try to remember them all. Um, I'll, I'll phrase it this way. You've got a 10-year-old son, right? Yep. Let's say he wants to be a software developer. Yep. He's got He's got available to him university. Yep. He's got available to him LinkedIn Learning. Yeah. He's got Code Academy. He's yep. got other. He's got YouTube. Yep. If he if he says, "Dad, want to be a software developer?" Um, obviously, the the quicker he's employed, the quicker he's earning money. If he goes mm -hmm. to university, he's putting that back by potentially three years, or maybe he's maybe he's coding while he's at university. Mm -hmm. If you if if you're to provide him some advice, in you know we're twenty twenty two at the moment. Um, how would you try to encourage him? And it might not be the answer for the same person for every person, but just keen to see your opinion. I would encourage my son to go to university. That, I would do that. But aside from that, university only takes you so far. It won't make you stand out, right? Well, I guess if you, even, if you, even if you get all the best marks in university, I think you'll get headhunted by some of the top firms and stuff. But I feel like once you're in that position, you'll still struggle if you just have the university behind you. A good thing nowadays that people have access to is open source projects. So I would actually encourage him to get involved, get involved in some open source projects, create a couple of pull requests, throw it up onto open source project, get some feedback, let, let them tell you what you're doing wrong. And then get, get a pull request merged into one of the open source projects or something like that. Yeah. We're actually part of a, a greater collective actually trying to achieve something. Yeah. And I think that's always, that's the power of the current information age where we're kind of this hive of information and things that's at your disposal and you can become part of that or you can try and just feed off that but i think it's better to just be part of that and kind of learn how to work in that system and then you can yeah so open source projects read a lot of blog posts don't just assume you know the answer always e even if you've done it before you still don't know the answer go yeah. back and reassess it again and yeah. read again and all that so yeah yeah, man, that's an interesting take. Um, I, I, I really like that take, actually. Uh, it's not one I've heard before. Um, one of the things that I guess we work with, when I'm recruiting, if I was a junior, yeah. or somebody going through university, or somebody that's done a code academy or something like that, would be to build something. Build something, publish it online, like get, get something live, build a game, build mm -hmm. a website, build something to show that you've actually gone through that process and it's not just theoretical knowledge. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, you get some code up there, um, get yeah, other people looking at it. I, th I feel like that just, as you said, helps people stand out. Yeah, yeah. And, and it also, uh, to test, like you were saying, just make them build something. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Again, that, that by itself, anybody can make it work, Yeah. right? But they have to actually then really, you, you want to look at how they approached it, right? Yeah. That they, that they think about the fundamentals, that they set up the project correctly, that they, that they build the code properly, that they write nice clean code, that they think about the fundamentals, not just make it work. It's, it's always that the difference between a software developer, sorry, a, a coder and a software engineer, yeah. right? A coder can make stuff work, that's yeah. great, right? A software engineer will structure build, make things scalable, make things maintainable long-term. So you want to see them almost instinctively, naturally do that or follow that process. Yeah. As a junior, it's a forced thing, right? As a junior, you have to see they, they're following a process that they've learned. Yeah. Right? As a senior, it just has to be second nature. No, I, I really enjoyed the take. <laughs> um, mate, if we go further on the career then, um, you, you've you finished your university degree. And as you said, I think it was the past five, seven years that you've worked more in a sort of a software development manager type role. Yep. Um, I guess there's interesting pathways for software engineers. Uh, you can either stay super technical mm -hmm. and be hands-on coding and never take on people management and just mm -hmm. be a really strong technical software engineer and still earn a lot of money, right? Yeah. Or you can start to take on that team management route. Um, which is the route that you've gone. Can you just talk to me about that transition period for you as in going from day-to-day -day banging out code to starting to think more around, you know, building teams, managing teams? Yeah, I think, I think the starting out point is you, you need to not be in a job where you're banging out code. If, you, if you're in that job, you're in the wrong job, even as a junior, 
Yeah. Right. You need to be from the start, you need to look for the job where you are part of a team and you're working as a collective and you're achieving something. You're learning dev practices, you're learning code quality practices, you're learning all these things that make software work and scale and grow, right? Yeah. If you're in that scenario, if you're in that kind of ecosystem, right, you learn all those skills, right? And by the time you learn them, the new juniors are coming in, yeah. right? And you get, like you said, you get the people who just want to stay technical, right? They usually just become mentors. Sometimes they, I kind of see them as going the architect route, yeah. right? Um, and they just, they start focusing more on, it, it's, it's really hard, right? Irrespective of which way you go, right? What you're actually doing is you're getting closer to the business. Yeah. So if you're, if you're going down the architect route, right, you're starting to, because you understand the ecosystem, right, you're starting to talk, work with the business and then find projects and how to apply projects within that ecosystem effectively. That's what an architect does. Yeah. It's a technical business analyst, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so you're still closer to the business. You're still not really cutting code anymore. Yeah. Always if you're an architect. Um, or you can just be a super senior developer who's just cutting code and that's what you love doing and that's what you get your kicks out of. And people, I've known a lot of people like that in my life. And they don't actually go either way. They just stay senior developer. Yeah. They sometimes specialize. I've, I know a guy who specialized in, um, uh, in big data, for example. Yeah. Right. So he specialized. And the specialization then made him earn more and more and more. Yeah. Right. Whereas, um, but you have to be careful of your specialization. Doesn't to, put you in a box. Yeah. You have to you have to keep your specialization broad enough. Don't don't be a specialized in Power BI. That that when that project uh, pro product goes yeah. out of scope, then you out of a job, right? You want to be a big data specialist, right, or something, right? And then the my route is the people, and and they just come out of the woodwork by themselves, right? It's the people who who start leading, all right? They just start leading. They just it it just happens, yeah. right? And um, it'll have, and especially the people who you can see they're leading and they're uplifting the people around them. Those are the people that management then start looking at and going, oh, okay, well, lead this project for me, lead this project for me. And then once you've done it, yeah. uh, if you've done it for a couple of years, even if it's not your official role, you can, you can just go and apply for a role as a leadership role somewhere else and you'll usually get it because you've got that. Those skills. Those skills. But yeah, it's just, it's from, from day one, from don't be a lone horseman sitting in a corner coding. Yeah. You don't want to be that because you're never going to go to leadership from there or, or even architecture from there. You yeah. want to be part of a, a team structure. So it sounds like it was less of a conscious decision to want to be a people manager and more of a, it played to your strengths. You obviously took on mentorship, you took on management and just grew from there. Basically, really. At Student Edge, that's exactly what happened. I just, I was sitting in a team of developers. They hired other developers around me and I just, became the de facto leader. Yeah. Um, they actually hired a, um, a lead over our team, but he wasn't technical. Yeah. So I just ended up becoming the technical lead. Yeah. Um, and he started referring to me as the technical lead and I just, that it was just what happened. Um, and so, yeah, so when I went over to RSC Insurance, I just said, I want to be in a lead role still. Yeah. And I went through a small technical lead stint and then I went into leadership, so. Leadership doesn't you know, come without its challenges, right? No. And then uh, a couple of years ago, COVID comes out of the blue yep. and you're leading a team through COVID pandemic. You know, you would have had to lead a team going from you pr predominantly, you know, you've got, you've got your uh, office down near Lake Macquarie there. Yeah. Um, people are in the office five days a week. Um, obviously some flags in there, but yeah, you're predominantly on site <laughs> and then click of finger, everyone's fully remote. Uh, how was that experience for you as a leader? Uh, it, it, for my team in particular, it was a bit weird because um, it was a very young team when we started. Mm -hmm. And even when this, the, we started breaking up, it was, we hired probably more than half our team during COVID. Yeah. So uh, a lot of it, but it was certainly a challenge. I mean, I remember frantically scrambling to get a VPN up yeah. and frantically scrambling to get all these kind of things set up and, um, you know, all the, um, what do you call it? setting up the desk properly and all that kind yeah. of stuff, getting people, ergonomics, to fill in, yeah. ergonomics, getting people to fill in forms of their home systems, trying to get buy kits for them, whatever, just to keep the ball rolling, right? So that was, it was a bit manic in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but I think once we got into it, it was fairly 
uh, it just kind of worked. It actually worked very well in the beginning. So yeah, and then you kind of, I feel like everything, it kind of becomes a bit of a rut. Yeah. And I feel like that's kind of, we're heading that way now. Everybody's getting a bit fatigue of working from home. Yeah. And they're they wanting to come back a little yeah. bit more. I feel like, uh, you know, everyone's forced to go remote and everyone enjoyed aspects of that. Yeah. Uh, remote in the future, I think maybe a little different. Uh, there's people that are definitely uh, looking for that office interaction, human interaction yeah, again. Definitely. There's some people that have loved full remote and will never go back to an office. So I feel like it'll be a bit of a horses for courses, like it, every individual will react differently, but it'd be interesting yeah. to see how businesses who are forced to go remote, you know, then operate post pandemic. I actually think the biggest challenge coming up is how do you manage that mix? Yeah. Right, because you're going to have some people working remotely and some people working in the office. And even before the pandemic started, right, if you had people working remotely, they often got overlooked for promotional stuff. They often got overlooked just for getting, getting opportunities, all those kind of things they got overlooked for. Yep. If half your team is working remotely, you go and have to not have that happen. You have to be very careful yep. about making sure people still get the opportunities that they would have when they were in the office if it's a split thing. So I think that's going to be a big challenge. Yeah, that, well, we've done the same thing as an organization gone remote first, like all communication now gets done remotely, doesn't yet. It's not the meeting yeah. in the office where everyone or but three or four people find out. Um, it's, you know, everything, all the communications have to be online. And I feel like, uh, as you said, there's some challenges. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out longer term. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, when you went remote, was there any tools, uh, software that you guys use that you thought were? Uh, we did everything through Teams, really. So that was easy. We used Jira boards and things like that, like the Kanban boards um, for work. And so, yeah, just really Teams yeah. for video calls. Um, I've known the organization you work for, Biscuit, for many years now, and mm -hmm. there's been quite an evolution there. Yeah. Um, from It's one of those companies, I think, that uh, is – Interesting from the perspective of, you know, scratching your own itch and then that turning into another product as well. Uh, consultancy background, which turned into both obviously consultancy, yeah. but now another arm through uh, a SaaS service. Mate, can you give people a bit of an overview of what you're working on at the moment or some of the exciting projects you've been working on or coming up? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, our main app that we have, it's like a warehouse management app. Um, the, some of the companies refer to it as the gun app. So it's like it sits on the barcode scanning guns. Yeah. Um, and, and that it's, it's actually a very, it sits on top of big, um, ERP backend system called yeah. Epicor. And so you kind of, uh, it, it just does a lot of the warehouse functionality for that, for you. So a lot of the flows and things is automated through the app, um, and that kind of stuff. So we always building that out. We are actually just about to start a big project to actually uplift that whole thing a little bit. So that's always in the background because it's probably our biggest single product that we have yeah um then we also do a lot of integrations so that took off like crazy uh, probably a year or two ago yeah uh, we did a few people got wind of it and it just it just got going crazy so now again erp integrations with things like um storefronts is popular like shopify and yeah. e-commerce and that kind of stuff but also financial systems um just staff management creating accounts all that kind of stuff, um, just those kind of integrations. And then we've also started, because of our success with the, the big app, um, started people started approaching us for smaller bespoke apps yeah. that also kind of sit in that, on that same kind of back-end ecosystem of the ERP. So we've built dispatch boards and all kinds of stuff that then sits on top of that as well. So, yeah, it's very varied. It's a very mixed bag of projects that we're involved in. Yeah. Um, they always have a... a some connection points somewhere with with the ERP system. Yeah. Um, some more than others. We've got a rental management system which can stand on its own, but it also has a tight integration with with that ERP. So, yeah, it's interesting. We've got lots of little, lots of moving parts and lots of different kind of projects all the time. So it's good. It's, it keeps it interesting. Yeah, mate, what I find interesting, and I think it's um, there's a lot of businesses that sort of start out. I, I guess not pure software development businesses to start with. Yeah. But then software. Um, software development opportunities present themselves, you know, yeah. creating bespoke apps, for example, and then, hey, if you create that one app and 
some people or more pay, more and more people yeah. are looking for that, turning that into a product in itself and then selling that product as a, yeah. as a SaaS offering, I think it's quite interesting, as opposed to starting out as a pure, you know, pure software development company or an app company. Um, yeah. I, I think, or from my experience, I've seen a lot of companies had a lot of success with that because you've got a core business, you understand the customers, yeah, exactly. you understand their needs, and then you're, you're building software for a customer who's actually paying for it rather than you going out and building software from the start yeah. without that customers there. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the, well, the customers is one thing. That, that's great because we, we tap into that, those, that customer base, right? But um, I think it's just great to have the customer base, but from us, from the knowledge point of view, um, the customers tend to have access to the same things that we do, but because we've got this breadth of knowledge behind us, we, we tend to make things just work and work and do it quicker. And because we've got the consulting side of the business and we've got the development side of the business, the consultants is always there to draw from. Yeah. So when you're building all these things, sometimes just, just having those consultants there to go and ask simple questions for, that's something that a lot of these companies struggle with if they're trying to do it by themselves. So we, we have that on tap right next to us and we can just get that information straight out and actually do things much quicker. Yeah, I, I just think it provides you such a uh, such an advantage over a company who's building, you know, let's call it a startup for, for scratch building yeah. it up you, you're investing in building software without actually you know you can build an mvp and try that with customers along the way and then iterate and build and build but having those consultants you can tap into the customers having those piece that that core information yeah exactly. embedded within the business just provides you such a better opportunity oh, it's like a superpower yeah to, to yeah. actually have some success with that yeah it's great and, and like i said because it's so varied um it got, actually gives a challenge for them as well because they end up having to think about the ERP in a way they haven't thought about it before. So um, for the dispatch um, mechanism, for example, uh, fleet management and that kind of stuff, that's all different ways of thinking about the ERP and how does, how does the ERP feed into that and how does it work and uh, how do we send information back into that. So it's all fun challenges. Yeah, nice. Mate, uh, you've talked a bit about leadership. You've talked a little bit about the company at the moment. Um, one of the challenges across Australia at the moment is a lack of talent in Australia. I think um, through the pandemic, we obviously lost a lot of people on school visas, borders have been closed, more and more companies investing in technology, talent shortage across the board. You've talked about leadership, you talked about what you guys are building at the moment. Um, what are the things that you look for in trying to hire people into your teams? Yeah, I think it's kind of what I was talking about before. It's about somebody who can work at a team, somebody who can be part of a cohesive team. Yeah. Um, at Biscuit, I don't assign work to individuals ever. I always assign work to teams. And so, and I think that's that's becoming a more common way of doing things anyway. Um, so being able to find somebody who is who can comfortably hook into that kind of team and kind of contribute to that team and kind of feed all and uh, yeah, both actually get something out of the team, but actually put something back into the team. Yeah. Those kind of things is good. And then obviously, Technical talent is important as well. Yeah. And when it comes to technical talent, it's always about those people, again, like I said in the beginning, about um, being able to show me that they can think from progressively, like starting from the fundamentals and working their way up rather than just starting right at the top. Yeah. If you had a choice between taking somebody with the technical chops but not that team player attitude or the team player attitude without the technical chops? Probably go with the team player. And I have in the past, and it's actually worked out very well for me. So it's, it's always a tough choice. You, 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 when you're interviewing, you've got one position or two positions to fill, right? Sometimes, if you're lucky, you have the opportunity to interview 15, 20 people, yeah. right? So then you, you get that conundrum yeah. very often. It's like, this guy's very, very strong technically, but he's not a good team player. Yeah. Um, or this guy's a great team player, he's okay technically. Um, he can probably hold his own, yeah. but he's a great team player and he'll, he'll do well in the team. And so I generally err on those guys yeah. just because it's, it, they actually achieve more with their team than the guys who's trying to fight their team constantly to, to get things done their way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I, I agree. I think also if you can overlay, they might not have the technical know-how at the moment, but they've shown ability to learn in the past mm -hmm. and they might have been learning a new subject, might have been learning something brand new. Yeah. The ability to learn overlaid with a good attitude or a team player, I think, you know, will set you up long term um, because especially in software development, right, there's a very good chance at some point within the next couple of years, they're going to have to learn a new language or a new framework or something else. And if they've got that ability to learn, yeah, um, yeah, 
That and you, awesome. you can tell that in an interview pretty quickly. Yeah. They, they will they will say it yeah. over and over again um, in an interview, the fact that they like to learn. And, and especially the guys who can bring up examples, right? The guys who are sitting in the, in the interview and he's saying, I've done this example, blah, 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 as opposed to just robotically telling you, I do learning. You're like, okay, that's nice. Okay, let's carry on. Yeah. Versus the guys who's saying, oh, I love, I love reading the LinkedIn articles. So I love doing this. So, you know, Udemy is my favorite or whatever. We, they start using examples and you know, they're talking the truth, right? And then, you know, they actually, actually yeah. those kind of people who want to learn. So it's easy to pick them out in the interviews. I completely agree. And the uh, pandemic or post pandemic, I guess, to an extent at the moment, potentially, how have you guys managed that? Are you, are you a couple of days back in the office? Are you looking at a bit of a hybrid or fully remote approach? What, what's it look like for you, for you and your team going forward? I don't think we've completely figured it out yet. I think it's forever going to be more flexible than it has been. Yeah. Um, but for us right now, we're fully remote still mostly. Yeah. And I think we're going to start trickling in back into the office. just trying to get people in, maybe not all of them at a time, maybe a team at a time or a couple of people at a time, or, or maybe just even just meeting for a drink. Yeah. Right. Just starting to bring the people back slowly. Um, you just don't know at the moment. It, it, we've been in again, out again, in again, out again over the course of the pandemic, because I mean, when the first variant died down a little bit, everybody started coming back and then Delta came out and everybody went back to yeah. the office and then that sort of dying down again. So everybody came back to the office and then I'm going to and then it's back. Yeah. And it's just like, ugh, it, it's almost more disruptive to just to do that. So everybody is now, I think a little bit hesitant to just bring people back again. You're like, no, let's just stay where we are. Let's meet up as much as we can. Yeah. Um, and just actually make sure that it's actually gone now Yeah. Uh, before we all bring everything back and because then it's all carrying computer screens and things into the office yeah. and setting up everything again. Yeah. Yeah. And then how's that affected your life? Obviously you're managing a team. Um, you've got two kids, a uh, wife, two kids, um, you know, managing a team, COVID, no more commute. Um, has it been a thing where because you don't have to close your computer at, you know, five, six, whatever it might be, you work through the night and you spend more time in front of there. How's that affected your life? Uh, I've, my whole life has been really good at actually switching off, which I think is just my personality or something, but I, I, I tend to switch off when I'm done with work, I'm done with work for the yeah. day. Um, so that from that point of view, I've been okay. Working at home has been challenging at times and noisy at times, especially when homeschooling was going on at the same time. Yeah. As you can imagine, um, everybody can relate. So it's affected me in that sense. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, we're managing. I think the, the, the hard part from a work point of view is just how do you monitor performance when you don't see the people, right? And that's really hard because metrics don't tell the full story, right? So then you need to find other ways and yeah. Yeah, there's definitely some challenges. I feel like uh, most companies are trying to figure different aspects out. I don't mm. think I don't think most companies have everything sorted yet. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the next couple of years play out. Um, and I think it'll it'll be different company to company and individual to individual because uh, people start to figure out what their yep. cadence is like with being back in an office, with commuting, with being around other humans, with yep. wanting to work remote. And I think that'll just vary person to person. And I think we'll get to a point where some peak companies are fully remote and mm -hmm. will stay that way. Some companies will be a, a hybrid approach and we'll be happy to sort of, you know, yep. stick their, their flag in the ground saying we are hybrid. Like you can come in here and see, you know, see other humans if that's what you look. Um, and that won't suit the people that want fully remote. So I feel like we'll get to that point where where, you know, people will know what they want and know uh, what suits them and then you yeah. know, pick and choose that way. With all this going on, how do you structure your day? Do you use uh, any software? Do you use a calendar tool? Do you use a to-do list? Is there any software or anything you use to manage your day? Um, I've actually started using a tool called Air Focus. I don't know if it's a fairly new thing. Um, and, it, yeah, it was, it was introduced to me by... Um, I think Greg introduced me to uh, some business coach guy and he just mentioned that some company was using it yeah. um, that he was coaching. And it's actually, it's, it's, it's just a way of high level planning. Yeah. Um, it's really good. It's got like, uh, you know, the, the general Gantt charts and it's got, um, it's got Kanban boards and it's got, um, like it, it can actually help you f figure out, you know, the, uh, the high value and the difficulty kind of projects kind of figure that out and kind of place it so you know what's the quick ones and the strategic bits. And so it's just a nice tool for that 
high level planning. Yeah. And we actually now do, um, uh, I do all my high level planning on that, just the project, the pipeline, all that kind of planning I use that for. Yeah. And we've actually started slowly but surely, um, we do company wide um, meetings now, we call them uh, project alignment meetings, where we do, uh, we look at that board and we all go through the board together and go, okay, so what's coming up? Where's this app? Is this still in design? Is this still in pre sales? Is this still, where is this app? Is it ready to go? Yeah. Whatever. And so, yeah, it's a really good tool. It's a good way to sort of get alignment across the business when you, as you said, you got a software development and that aspect, you've got some consultants, you've got the actual business itself and you're yeah. like getting that alignment. Yeah. I think, I, th- I think the consultants still, um, it's more we i only really use it for the overlap yeah um and for development at this point the consulting stuff works a bit differently yeah but yeah it's yeah it's working very well so far for me nice so you work that for the high level stuff and then you know the minute stuff is a g is a calendar Jira. yeah it goes Cal- to jira yeah oh, oh you mean just normal yeah calendar yeah um but yeah but oh, the teams work off jira so it goes from that high level for air focus board and it goes a card on that becomes an epic in jira and yeah then the Team start breaking it down. Yeah, very nice. Um, from a continual education perspective for yourself, I think you just mentioned business coach. Um, is a bit business coach books? Are you a reader? Are you a podcast listener? Um, yeah. What do you do to continue? You know your career growth. I, I read. I read a lot of blogs. Yeah. I think that's basically where I use things. Come, but it's it's usually bit re, the way I function is a little bit reactive. It's usually. I'm getting into situations which I don't know the answer. And even though I think I know the answer, I generally don't know the full answer. Um, so my, uh, I'm blogging on LinkedIn quite a bit. And yeah. what I'll do is I'll just write down my thinking in a blog post. Yeah. And I won't publish it. it sometimes I'll sit there for six months before I publish it because then I'll go read blog posts and refine and kind of, yeah. kind of talk to people and kind of do experiments in my team and see how things pan out and whatever. And then that's kind of how I kind of structure my thinking about, okay, how do I proceed with this? And then I usually publish them and then when I'm done. Yeah. So that's usually how I do my learning. Is there any blogs in particular or is it you'll pick a subject, as you said, or a problem and then go deep dive into yeah. one section rather than, hey, there's a that go-to blog that you know, solves all the problems? Yeah, it's more like that. I think it, uh, there's, there's too much opinions out there. And I feel if you, if you pick one guy, if you're like, I'm using Jeff's blog as my guidance, yeah. you get one guy's opinion. You want to hive that you went everybody, right? You want all those opinions and then make your own opinion all for that. So I think that's... Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, no, I don't disagree. Mate, if you are, if you took it all together and uh, you know wound it back to a younger version of yourself, is there any like key piece of advice that you would give yourself to say, "Hey, I might time over." I think I actually it is, it's funny through my whole career, right? Various people have told me this piece of advice in different kind of ways, yeah, and I never got it. I, I seriously, I never got it until about three or four years ago, right? And the, the basic of the advice is don't react, right? And I actually, somebody posted something on LinkedIn the other day, which actually put it slightly better. He said, they say, um, observe and learn instead of reacting. Yeah, instead of reacting because not everything needs your reaction, save your energy for what matters. And I think that is, that is so, so important. It's just that ability, to, and that's what I tell myself, is just stop, slow down, listen more, right? And read more and absorb more before you give an opinion. And I say that to a lot of the junior guys that I'm into, it's like anybody, so anybody can jump to and give a reaction, right? And just that obvious answer, right? But if there's senior people sitting around you in a room, there's probably a reason they're not saying that. Yeah. Right, it's not because they don't know it. Or they don't have an opinion. They don't have an opinion. They They actually have already dismissed that for some reason. Right, you're blurting it out, and now you're actually making more of a problem because now the business person's guessed that. And so I think it's just that kind of keeping quiet, observing, learning, hearing what everybody's saying. And then right at the end, if you have actually something valuable to add, add that, because that's actually going to save the day. But don't react with a, re- with a, with a solution in anything you do in life, really. Don't react to solutions. I think that's probably my key advice that I give your younger self to. Uh, I would definitely give that version to a, a 20, 20s version of myself. <laughs> I remember, yeah, saying out my career and, you know, being in a, a meeting room um, yeah. and wanting to be the person. I've got an opinion and, and wanted to be heard. Whereas, as you said, people that have been around a lot longer uh, who know a lot more are the ones being quiet in those rooms yeah. and taking a lot more listening before talking. Um, yeah. 
yeah, what I thought I knew back then versus what I actually knew were two different things. I think it's it just a, it's a common thing for younger people. It's like, yeah. uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know what we thought. I can't remember what I was thinking back then, but I did the same thing. I just reacted with the first solution. And that's not great. And it actually derails things more than it actually helps normally. Yeah. So yeah, just observing, learning, actually understanding the ecosystem, understanding the problem, understanding what they already. And I think that's something that a lot of juniors also don't like to do. They're like, that that's that's there already as crap that that should be better and they just want to go and rewrite it yeah but actually having taken the time to actually go and look at that and go why is it like that why did they do it like that understanding that properly first yeah before you go diving and just changing and do it all over again and probably making the same mistake those people did and then going back to what they had originally so power enlisting right powering yeah. taking that one step back yeah and um looking at it from you know, one step back as opposed to being in, in the furnace or in yeah, that exactly. decision. Mate, I completely agree. It's, uh, it's good advice. It's advice I'd definitely give myself as well. <laughs> mate, uh, thanks for the time today. No it was, uh, it was Mate, it was really good for me. I, in, I enjoyed being back in a podcast face-to-face. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's been, it's been a while, actually. Yeah. Um, and so, mate, if people want to, you know, find out a little bit more about you or, hey, if they've got a question, um, is the best way for them to contact you on LinkedIn? LinkedIn's easy. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I will link that up in the podcast notes on our website. So no worries. I'd appreciate your time today. No problem. Cheers.